The only way you can feel sorry for Andrew after watching Scoop is if you believe royals are better than and should never be questioned. This comment is spot on, and I want to discuss it because, well, many people do believe, as they have been told, that the royal family is better than, you know, ordained by God and all, and shouldn't ever be questioned. And while this applies to all of the bloodborne royals, it is particularly true of the men, which is more than evident in the difference in how the royal family and the media treat Andrew versus how they treat Meghan. Andrew is often portrayed as the black sheep of the family, or a wayward prince, but his behavior is actually in line with what we've seen from royal men for centuries. If we wanted to do a deep, deep dive into this, we could go all the way back to Henry VIII and his six wives. These women are not known for how they lived their lives, but instead for how their lives ended, mostly as a result of their husband's actions, as many of their endings were brought about because they were unable to give Henry the male heir that he wanted. The women were only as valuable as their body's ability to produce an heir to continue the monarchy, and their value, or lack of, has continued as the story has been passed down from generation to generation through a nursery rhyme taught to children. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. This story is never taught with any discourse around violence towards women, misogyny, or patriarchy, but instead, each woman's life and her story are summed up in just one word. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. There is certainly not enough time on TikTok to explore all of the historical examples of the monarchy's subjugation of women, so let's focus on the current royals. How much has really changed since Henry VIII was having women killed for his inability to produce a son? While we may not see women beheaded in modern times, the monarchy's view of what women are valued for doesn't seem to have evolved much. In Spare, Harry retells the somewhat infamous story of Charles supposedly telling Diana after Harry was born, Wonderful, now you've given me an heir and a spare. My work is done, before going off to meet with his girlfriend. And when Diana was suffering, both with her mental health and bulimia, Charles and the firm were both equally dismissive of her. As Megan said, the firm is always more concerned with how things look than how they feel. And it's not as if Andrew is giving this respectable family a bad name. Who can forget about Charles's 30-year friendship with Jimmy Seville, who had over 200 confirmed sexual offenses, and who, of course, was awarded an OBE, which has never been revoked. So the only issue was that Andrew's problem became too public and revealed too much about the monarchy's internal patriarchal beliefs. And it isn't difficult to see how deeply ingrained these patriarchal views of women are within the monarchy, if the allegations against Andrew are true. The release of the Netflix movie Scoop has reopened the conversation, not just about the allegations themselves, but about Andrew's absolute lack of accountability or remorse. During his interview, his only aim was to prove his innocence, with no regard for the victims or regret over his friendship with Epstein, he even thought it would be a good idea to say this. For the record, is there any way you could have had sex with that young woman or any young woman trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein in any of his residences? No. Um, and, and, and without putting too fine a point on it, if you're a man, it is a positive act to have sex with somebody. You have to have to take some sort of positive action. And so therefore, if you try to forget, it's very difficult to try and forget positive action. Andrew's response to that question comes across that he thinks at best it would be a passive act for a woman and certainly calls into question his thoughts on a woman's agency and consent. Even in his official statement where he announced that he would be stepping back, he struggled to not see himself and presumably the other men involved as victims, saying that he sympathized with everyone who has been affected, not the victims, everyone, which of course would include himself. Andrew's actions, like Henry VIII, are often made out to be more of something to laugh at or a joke instead of something to have a serious conversation about. Channel 4 made a documentary about Andrew titled The Prince and the Pedophile, 
which plays off the title of the children's story, The Princess and the Pea, and spawned the hashtag time on Twitter. And while puns like this may be surface-level funny, they also erase the trauma of the situation and turn it into more of an acceptable humorous story than a crime that should be investigated. During his interview, Andrew also had complaints about social media. I think that the, 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 the problem um, that I'm, uh, we face in the 21st century is um, social media. There is a whole range of um, things that y you, you face now that you didn't face 25 years ago because it was just the print media. I think that Andrew is hinting at the hashtag MeToo movement, which was at its peak right around the time of this interview. Social media and movements like hashtag me too are effective in that even though Andrew has never been legally convicted, it makes his alleged actions harder to ignore. It gives victims a global platform and supporters a place to unite, which happened in the case of Virginia Jufree and Prince Andrew. Despite Virginia's massive online support, Buckingham Palace unsurprisingly protected their own. In a statement from a spokesperson released in this Daily Mail article, they say that Jufri's testimony doesn't hold up to scrutiny, despite flight details and photographic evidence supporting her claims. The monarchy's response to allegations of SA was essentially attempts to silence the stories and the closing down of Prince Andrew's social media comment sections. Their default to not believe the woman and to protect the male royal was even more noticeable as it played out alongside the very different treatment of yet another woman who'd married into that family. When Meghan married Harry, many claimed that as a driven, career-minded feminist, she would modernize the royal family, but it quickly became clear that those inside the institution had no plans to let that happen. Interestingly, in one of her first royal engagements, at a time when Andrew was complaining about being held accountable on social media, Megan publicly praised movements like Me Too and Time's Up. I think right now in the climate that we're seeing with so many campaigns, I mean, with Me Too and Time's Up, there is no better time than to really continue to shine a light on women feeling empowered and people really helping to support them. And of course, she received much scrutiny after the fact with articles like this one from Sarah Vine saying Megan should be a little less Me Too about her feminism. At a time when the spotlight should have been pointed directly at Andrew and his alleged crimes against women, the institution and the media instead chose to abuse another woman. In August of 2019, the same month that Epstein was found dead and his associations with people like Prince Andrew were global news, the royal correspondent for the UK tabloid The Mirror wrote 11 articles about Meghan, all negative, and only one story about Andrew and Epstein. Meghan who was patron of charities like SmartWorks, who wrote messages of affirmation to sex workers, and who guest edited the fastest selling edition of British Vogue ever, which featured female voices for change, was too much. Too much feminism, too much championing of women for an archaic institution that, as I mentioned earlier, has historically seen little value in women outside of their ability to produce an heir. And I think a deeper issue when it comes to Megan, both then and now, is that she challenges their deeply held views and boundaries with her feminism, as it's always intersectional when it comes to gender, class, and race. As Megan said in the Larry King interview, she believes that a woman can be both feminine and a feminist. So for royalists, she physically fits the ideal of what a royal woman should be with her beauty, but she challenges their beliefs by not being content with just being pretty and silent on the arm of a prince. She's vocal about all women being celebrated and uplifted, and for an institution built on patriarchy, that is incomprehensible. Megan challenges their beliefs on the class system, as someone who married into the very top of their society and dares to see herself as equal to those around her. She challenges their beliefs on race, as someone who chooses to live authentically as herself, and those with the colonial mindset cannot conceive of the idea of Black royalty. Megan's intersectionality forced conversations on feminism, classism, racism, xenophobia, and what it means to be royal. And she was criticized for it and abused to the point where she was forced to leave, while Andrew continues to exist quietly within the system, somewhat absorbed and shielded from the criticism he receives. Because there's always a place for the exploitation and abuse of women, but there isn't a place for the women who refuse to accept it. <laughs>